you so much, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's certainly been a terrific day, um, if a long one, and we appreciate you all being here for this important conversation. Um, and it certainly is a great way to bookend what we heard this morning from Secretary Kerry by having some really fantastic um, and thoughtful military leaders here with us. Um, we have General Steve Cheney, who's the CEO of the American Security Project based in Washington, DC. We have General Munir, who's the president of the Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, as well as the chairman of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. And I believe all three of you are involved with that, if that's correct and Admiral Neil Morissetti, who is an advisor for the Carbon Disclosure Project. Um, so we've got three different countries represented, three different continents represented, three different services, I believe, represented. Yes. Um, and what I'd like to ask you all to do, starting with you, Steve, is just um, give a few minutes of comments, and then I'd love to get into a discussion. Sure. Um, Secretary Kerry this morning I thought was fabulous. <clears throat> Spent entirely too much time talking about me. Um, <laughs> but I've known him for I quite a while. <laughs> Uh, and he's a remarkable person, as, as you all know. I did 30 years as a Marine, and uh, when I got out in 2001, I had just taken over or left from Paris Island, and my biggest experience there among training 20,000 plus Marines uh, was when I evacuated for Hurricane Floyd in 1999. 10,000 people had to go 200 miles because we were gonna be inundated 20 feet of water. Just one example of climate change and a direct impact on my career, and, and I followed that through with as being CEO of the American Security Project, which of course this is one of our huge topics to link national security to climate change, and I think we're gonna talk a great deal about that. So with that, Munir, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephen. I spent about 38 years in uniform, uh, both in the Pakistan military and then later on in the Bangladesh military, and. I've also been a UN peacekeeper for a long time. I headed the post-election stabilization mission of the United Nations in Cambodia. What I've seen during my career, in part particularly in handling with disasters in Bangladesh, which are very, very frequent, is the scale, the proportion, the intensity, the frequency is changing rapidly due to climate change. And the military is called upon more frequently to handle issues for which they are not called upon before in that same frequency. So we see a definite change, a deterioration in the landscape of the human security condition in the country. I'll leave it at that, but with Neil, you can continue. Um, I retired from the Royal Navy at the end of 2012 after more years than I care to remember, and I probably in that time as a ship driver consumed more energy than everybody else in this room put together. Um, <laughs> but I ended up as our government's climate and energy security envoy and then our foreign secretary's special representative for climate change. And I think from a European perspective, as far as climate change impacting on our security, it's what's happening hundreds and thousands of miles away in a globalized world. And the consequences of that and instability caused by the stresses of climate change, particularly food, energy, water, health, and demographics, already challenges in countries without necessarily the capacity to deal with them, is also affecting Europe. And what it's doing is impacting on geopolitical stability which is clearly military business, but it's not an end state in itself. That geopolitical stability is a prerequisite for our economic growth, prosperity, and well-being. So it is very much an issue at the forefront of, of, of national security. Um, thank you, Admiral. That's, a, um, I think, a really helpful tether, and I'd like to just stick with it for a moment, if we might. Um, we've spent a lot of today um, hearing from a lot of business leaders and, and political leaders, um, but this obviously is a very important session on a, on a key topic and aspect of this issue. And um, General Munir, maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit, just at a very fundamental level, why are military leaders focused on climate change? Why is this an appropriate conversation for the uh, military community? The reason is the scale of the devastation and the impacts that climate-induced conditions are bringing to various countries and continents is graduating to a level when, in the technical term, it will need to be securitized at a moment, meaning that the consequences are so grave the national governments will be unable to cope with it with partial involvement of national capacity, and they will have to bring in the total capacity of the state, and in that, the military is a key component or a key capacity of the state. It's also a given fact that the countries which are in the front line of, in the challenges of climate change are also countries which are weak and fragile, 
They lack in state's ability and capacity to build a response mechanism to face the changes of climate. Therefore, the military will have to be plugged in in meeting to the responses that the states mounts in facing the challenges of climate change. And in that, the military will provide a key component of the capacity. <coughs> it is again important for us to know that the military's ability and capacity will have to be meshed with the national's capacity to meet the challenge of climate change, but also the fact that it is not the business of the military alone to do this job. The military cannot solve the problem of climate change, but military can certainly bring in special capacity, special skills, and build what we would call in the military a whole of society's response, a whole of government's response, a whole of country's response, and maybe a whole of international community's response. You know, Kathleen, if I can piggyback on that comment a little bit, uh, the Marines are fond of saying we're the 911 force. Uh, but really, the militaries of all our countries are the 911 force for our countries. So when anything catastrophic occurs, who eventually gets called upon? And uh, Superstorm Sandy is perhaps the primest example here. Uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Air Guard, National Guard all had to respond to that, unbudgeted, by the way. Uh, yet they had to, be, had to go and be prepared to do that. So all our militaries are pretty good at planning, both tactical and strategic. Now, I've just mentioned natural disasters, and we respond to all those. And certainly with rising waters, all our bases and stations, particularly the naval stations, 30 of which are threatened by sea level change, we know they're going underwater. So that's a, a near-term problem. But then when you go, you broaden this out and go internationally, you can look at conflagrations all over the world uh, that deep down the seed was probably climate change. And as a consequence of that, our militaries, our in particular, and I know Muneers and Niels as well, recognize that long term, this is what caused or helped cause, for instance, Arab Spring, or contributed to the instability in Syria, or a little bit with the Tuaregs in Mali. So we plan long term because we're that 9-1 force that, that recognizes it. So I guess the point here and the reason we're up here, none of us are politically oriented one way or the other. We're, we're military folks or retired military folks. Uh, we can speak from the national security perspective and we recognize the threat of climate change. And I think, you know, that, picking up on that, at the end of the day, the job of the military as part of the wider security community is to understand what are the threats to national interest and global stability. And the analysis that goes on, that horizon scanning, putting headlights on full beam, looking at what's happening over the horizon, indicates that climate change is going to exacerbate the situation, whether it's the stuff that's already locked into the system or what will come if we don't take action to reduce those emissions. And this is what we are uh, often referred to as a threat multiplier, is that right? I think that's how it was discussed in the QDR yeah, I mean, this year. If the temperature rises and food yields go down at a time when the population is growing, or the population's aspirations are changing, acidity of the ocean means that fish stocks move on, flooding, loss of land, loss of livelihood, all of that is going to add to some tension. Different parts of the world, people react in different fashions. In some parts, they'll accommodate it. In other areas, they'll try and move. They may be able to. They may be trapped. Or, or the migration may put pressure, particularly if it's from a rural area to an urban area. And all of this has exacerbated the situation. As Steve said, we saw some of that manifesting itself in the Arab Spring, where we had a failed Russian wheat harvest at the same time as poor harvest in America and Australia because of bad weather, pushed the price of, of wheat up, pushed the price of bread up. One of a complex contributing set of factors in the markets. But what does that mean for us, thousands of miles away? Well, the price of fuel went up by $20 a barrel, and two quarters of $20 a barrel on oil is half a percent off GDP. And that's the sort of piece where it starts to hit home on, on, in communities well away from the countries directly affected. So I've heard all of you talk about um, the military as often the response force for events that may be um, caused by climate change or climate change as a contributing force to those events. Um, Steve, maybe I'll pick on you since you're based in Washington. Um, but it seems to me that um, it's often a, a set of decisions or, or non-decisions that are made at the um, political or economic level that ultimately get us to the point that we're needing to send out troops to address these challenges. How do you, how do you see these, um, the military response being acknowledged and, and factored sure. into political decisions, and how, if, if not appropriately, how does that need to change? Well, a great question, and it was one of the founding principles for the American Security Project, because 
Senators Kerry and Hagel, who we all know well, after the 2004 election, anytime they breathed climate change, were painted left-wing liberal, you know, you guys are green peacers all the way. And they said, geez, can, can you not look at this from a factual perspective? But the problem was getting the right spokesman to say that without somebody immediately going, oh, you left-wing liberal, you know, we, we're not gonna listen to you. And that's where the, the concept from our perspective came, that let's get eight or nine, three or four star generals and admirals to sit there and say, hey, we are the ones who have to respond to this. And we can tell you there, there is a huge problem. The, the kicker is we know what's causing it, you know, CO2 emissions. I mean, it's it's pretty simple equation here. Um, and can we not figure out a long-term way to help solve this problem? Because eventually, again, it's gonna come back to befall on the military to respond to that. So the thought was, and, and that lends to an organization that we are a part of, the, Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change, trying to get all the militaries of the world spun up on this. Now, the American Security Project's done a couple of studies. Uh, we now have released today the Global Defense uh, Security Index, where we went to every country and asked them if they had written into their strategic defense plans anything about climate change. And all we did was ask the question, did you or did you not? Some had done it a lot, some had done it a little, but 70% of the countries in the world had something in their documents. 30% did not, the 30% that didn't were mostly either third world or didn't have much of a defense establishment to start with. And the 70% includes China, Russia. Uh, I mean, most of your wealthy nations were in that list. So obviously, the militaries in those countries have recognized the threat of climate change and are planning for it. But I think it's important to tell our elected representatives that there is no security solution to climate change. You know, yes, the military have a part to play as part of society. They can contribute both in the adaptation and the mitigation piece. But at the end of the day, as many of the speakers have talked about t today, you know, this is a whole of society. It's breaking down some silos within government, between government and the business sector, the private sector. It's about national and it's about international. Um, but, you know, you can't assume, as in a, perhaps a state-on-state -state conflict, that, you know, that this is when you call the military and sort it out. That, that option doesn't exist. But the fact is there is also a lot of fear in people's mind when I talk to people, is that why is the military talking about this? Is this a ploy of the West again to have a grand strategy that we don't know? They, do, they want to bring in security to the aspect of to this climate change debate. Uh, the fact is that it is not about militarizing the problem. It is about the need to securitize if it is needed. And I can tell you one thing, the military is a very, very efficient machine but at the same time, if you have to involve the military in a job, they have to be told about it, they have to be trained, they have to be retooled in certain ways, they have to be skilled to provide the kind of operational abilities. So the military will have to have a preparatory time to be completely ready to meet the challenges of adaptation of the consequence managements of climate change. And for that, the military has to be told now, the time is running out, because the military will have to be given the time and the space so that they're ready to work on the project when they're called upon. So do, are we, um, do we need, are we looking for some sort of signal coming out of the, the meeting uh, this week here in New York that would give that sort of clarity that's uh, required to military well, I, leaders? I sure would hope so. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, certainly given the emphasis that the secretary put on it this morning, he was um, pretty emphatic about his message on climate change, and he, he obviously carries that banner, as I said, and yeah, we would certainly hope from tomorrow's climate summit uh, that there would be a, a challenge thrown down, that people would accept that challenge, there would be a statement, and I think everybody we had speak this morning from Ban Ki-moon, uh, Dr. Kim, I mean, that uh, they all like that sentiment. So I would, and certainly this forum put on by the climate group and CDP has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's kind of given that shove down the stream. And I've talked to many, many people today that they kind of feel more of a buzz this year than they have in yeah. previous years. And certainly the demonstrations yesterday uh, yeah. proving the point that there's, I think that f the fuse has been lit and I would hope something comes out of it this week. I mean, I think if we pick up on Christiana's, um, we had the must yesterday. Yeah. We've definitely heard today there's the can. Um, tomorrow, the people who are going to make the decision on the will are the ones that you and I and everyone else has gone out and elected as our representatives. I mean, put crudely, I elect a government 
or put my vote towards the government for a job and my safety and my well-being. And we've got, what we've got here is something that threatens both of those. So that should be the final nail in the coffin to, that uh, we've got to have the, the will tomorrow. What I feel is that uh, the countries which are on the front line of climate change impacts are countries also which are more politically active, aware of the situation. But the fact remains that it is not a problem of a single country somewhere else. What happens is that what is happening in the field of climate change will impact every country on the, on the earth and everybody is in together. For example, a lot of the things that we are talking here are no longer theories. These are practically happening on the ground. I come from a country, Bangladesh, where things are practically happening on the ground and we are impacted every day. Even as we talk here in New York, there are people whose lives are being torn apart by the impacts of climate change. There are people who are completely losing their long years of livelihood because their saline intrusion coming inside. They're losing their cultivable land. They're losing fisheries in the rivers. Their houses are being lost to the, to the water that is being waterlogged for a prolonged period of time. For example, the IPCC's report, I'm sure you know that, speaks about the sea level rise in the south of Bangladesh. And the country's national strategy paper says that when that happens, 20% of Bangladesh will be lost to the sea, creating a climate refugee population of 25 to 30 million people. These are staggering numbers. We have never even talked about these numbers anywhere in our history for many, many centuries. Imagine we talk about refugee population of a few thousands summer, and that destabilizes a country or a region. Here we are talking about 30 million people being, becoming climate refugees. If that happens, it will not be Bangladesh's problem. It will not be South Asia's problem. It will be a global problem. So it is a problem that has to be understood now. We have to plan for this on a global scale. These are global problems, and they will need global answers. It strikes me that the military is maybe uniquely or best suited to that sort of long-term planning. Um, can you talk a little bit about the advisory council that, that you chair and that you all are involved with and the sort of work that you're doing to help governments think through that in a more strategic way? The military advisory council is a combination of serving and retired admirals and generals from many countries. Our primary purpose and function is to analyze the security implications of climate change on a country-specific basis, on a region-specific basis, also on a global scale. In that analysis, we are seeing very, very green implications. We understand that very well, so we are taking this to our political masters and national governments. We are also working with a number of international organizations and bodies, also trying and providing our analysis of the security implications and dimensions of climate change, hoping that our input will go into policy making so that they understand the consequences of climate change, which are extremely grave. And we are asking national governments and international organizations to take notes so that they factor in the issue of the security dimensions of climate change because these dimensions are now graduating above the level of human security. They are going into the level of national security and international security. So that's basically the purpose of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change, or in short, GMAC. And I think it's about looking at climate change as a mainstream issue, mm -hmm. like any other mainstream risk to what governments are there to deal with and to do. And to encourage that, just as we see in a national security strategy, and Steve's just talked about that, a reflection of the impact of a changing climate and what it means, you need to see that in a financial strategy, you need to see it in the business strategy, in a health strategy, the um, foreign policy strategy, and if they're not there, what you've actually got is a flawed strategy. You've just missed out a great chunk of something that's going to affect all of us. Yeah. So it, it's trying to, to, to move the debate on from perhaps where it's, it's sat in the past, in no way decrying where it's been in the past, but saying, look, if you really want action, you need the heavy hitters, which is why you need the Secretary Kerry's and their equivalents around the world, talking about this as a mainstream challenge to our well-being and, and, and um, prosperity. Yeah, interesting. Uh, this morning I was sitting next to Christine Ferreras, and uh, she was hammering me because she said, Secretary Kerry is your Secretary of State, and, we, and he's got the foreign ministers, and he's kind of corralling them and beating them, saying that the, he says, it's your turn, pointing to me. You need to get all the Secretaries of Defense. I said, well, I'm, I don't work there anymore. But the, uh, 
uh, but she said, yes, but you know him. And I said, well, I do, but, and, and Secretary Hagel has certainly beat that drum on climate change. If you go back to the Quadrennial Defense Review put out in February, it's got four pages plus on climate change. So, so he gets it, but her point was, the other defense ministers need to be corralled. And I think, it, Neil, it builds on your point. You get the foreign ministers, you get the defense ministers. Okay, let's get the heads of state. Let's get everybody rolling. And I think that's, we hope, part of what might be coming tomorrow with the climate summit that uh, President Obama will show up. We can get a, a, the energy going and get all the heads of state involved. Get the, and you're right, Neil, it's a, it's a government problem. It's not a military problem. It's the government's problem. There's another issue that I wanted to bring is that when we are talking to governments and various organizations, we are also acknowledging that one of the biggest polluters in the world is the military itself. But we are not polluting for polluting sake because this is the task that has been given to the military. So we are also uh, talking and analyzing how, the, how to green the military. And I can tell you one thing that I see that there is a tremendous effort by all militaries in the world to green themselves. So what we are saying that we now, not, now must work to reduce the footprint of the militaries in the field of climate change impacts. If I can just piggyback on Munir's comment for a se second here, the number one consumer of fossil fuels in this country is the Department of Defense. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Here we are talking about we need to get greener, we need to get off of fossil fuels, we need to reduce emissions, and here we're producing the most the Department of Defense is. But they know it, and they understand it, and they would desperately love to get off that tether. And it is a tether. It's a, it's a vulnerability that we've lost thousands of soldiers and Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines, who've been trying to transport fuel to our forces in the field. If we can get off that fuel, have alternative energy sources, we'll be safer, we'll be cheaper, we'll be polluting much, much less. And I think, I think all our militaries are looking hard at that. They're using solar, uh, they're using wind power. We've, I've been to a number of bases this past year. Uh, one out at Nellis has a huge solar array. Uh, they're all trying to go to what's called net zero bases where they produce as much energy as they consume. Um, they get it, they're not there yet, but, but Munir, they're working on it, and you're right. And there's a read across to the commercial world as well, in the sense, as Steve's talked about, you know, the risks and the costs of moving fuel in the operational theater, um, blood and treasure, but it was also constraining our ability to do our business. So if you look at uh, the energy strategy, the DOD one here, or the one in the Ministry of Defense in the UK and similar in other countries, it's driven by what is to deliver your outputs more effectively? Cut your risk and cut your cost. And I think that probably mirrors across a, a wide sectors of industry as well. Um, that same principle of doing the, producing your outputs more effectively at a lower price, uh, less risk, uh, has benefit for all. I know here in the US there's been um, a fair bit of pushback on DOD investments in renewables and alternative fuels. A lot of folks saying, um, and granted these are some of the climate skeptics, but a decently broad range that, you know, that sort of work is the job of the Department of Energy. It's not the job of the Department of Defense. How do you respond well, to that here? You know, it does go across uh, all agencies, no doubt. I was with Secretary Mavis last week, and of course he's the one who's perhaps taken the most heat because his goal is to have 50% of the Navy powered by alternative fuels by 2020. They just made a big announcement on Friday too. Yeah, so I mean, he's, yeah. and he's dead set on that. And uh, interestingly, uh, he's already run virtually all his ships that run on fossil fuels, not the nuke ones, but the, uh, uh, the ones that run on fossil fuels, he's used biofuels or alternative fuels in all of them now, so they can do it. All the aircraft in our Air Force uh, have now used uh, biofuels, alternative fuels, and, and it works just as well. Um, and he has, the criticism has been there, and the, the main criticism is it's inordinately expensive. Yeah. Uh, and then you hear the arguments about it's killing the food crops, there's not enough food crops. I mean, it's, again, I referred to the line I used this morning, a lot of that is just pure propaganda and not true. Yeah. The, uh, the, price is gonna, the price is expensive. It is coming down, and it's coming down fast. Some say 2018, maybe as late as 2020, It'll equal the same cost of a gallon of biofuel will equal the cost of a regular fossil fuel gallon. Uh, so why would you not aim it that way? Yeah. And, and I'll, one of my last, and my staff has heard this uh, to no end, uh, they caught it, he called it the green fleet that he had at RIMPAC out in Hawaii last year, and they did it again this year. He called it the green fleet because he fueled them for a while all on biofuels. I, I think it would have been a better moniker to use, call it America's fleet, because yeah. it was because it was run on fuels grown, grown here, by yeah. America's farmers and American ships. 
and so it's America's fleet. So it, 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 the problem with green, of course, you get that left lean and you kind of go, okay, okay, it's America's fleet, but we're using biofuels. And I it love works. that. We'll put you on the messaging team over at DOD. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, in, in response to the cost issue, I, um, I was reading a little bit about the announcement on Friday, and my understanding is that um, they gave um, th three big projects are going to be um, funded through a joint, um, I think it's DOD. Uh, DOE USDA effort, um, and they're going to be producing uh, 100 million gallons of drop-in biofuels. But the requirement is that they have to be cost competitive with traditional fuels. So, um, you know, tough. we're already um, pushing that direction. So it's exciting. And which they are. Yeah, it's great. Um, so, you know, we've we've talked a lot about Secretary Kerry's re remarks this morning, and I think one of the things we've heard him say before, and he reiterated it again today. Um, is that um, climate change deserves to be, you know, on the list of the top national security threats, along with uh, terrorism, along with weapons of mass destruction, um, and he's certainly gotten some pushback from certain corners uh, for that statement. I wonder if each of you could address your perspective on that, and if it, it deserves to be up there on that list. I think Secretary Kerry is absolutely right when he says that these are equal to weapons of mass destruction because. In terms of the impact area, or in terms of the number of people whose lives are being impacted negatively, there is not even a, a, any comparison that it can be happening through a source of any other weapons or weapon systems. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the, in the long-term consequences that it has on people's lives, in, on the environment, on the stability situation of a country or a region, these are certainly can be equated with weapons of mass destruction. The second thing which the secretary probably indicated is that when you marginalize people beyond a fringe because their lives become so insecure in terms of their economic security because their livelihoods are being lost or they have lost their, their habita habitation areas or their health conditions are so poor due to climate induced conditions that they're completely in the margins of society economically and socially, these people become so vulnerable that this is the ready breeding ground or recruiting ground for all sorts of terrorist activities, all sorts of international criminal gangs. And in terms of South Asia, we have seen some very marginally pushed communities and groups where from Al-Qaeda in, in, in Afghanistan, they have come to recruit there. There have been international criminal gangs who have recruited people from there. So these are practical examples. These are not just concepts and theories. Whenever climate-induced people and population are pushed to the margin beyond the limit, that will be the breeding ground of future ISIS or future Al-Qaeda's or international criminal gangs. So you really see a linkage there between the I see a definite climate, linkage, yeah. and I see it's already happening. It is not something that will happen in the future. In many countries, in South Asia, in sub-Saharan Africa, these instances are very, very clear. We are seeing the examples in Africa. We are seeing the examples in Asia. Yeah, I think the, the, the world today is a pretty complex world. There are a lot of factors which are inducing instability and insecurity. But as Manir has said, there is some pretty compelling practical evidence that the impact of a changing climate, be it the extreme weather events or the onset of long-term trends, is exacerbating that challenge. And by virtue of the fact that the world we live in is a globalized world, Therefore, although it may not be directly impacting on us, it is having an effect that Secretary Kerry is right, that in our analysis of those threats to global stability and prosperity, we need to factor in the impact of climate change. It's unlikely, I mean, it can't be ruled out, it's unlikely climate change is going to be a direct cause of conflict. But it is, there's pretty compelling evidence that it is making the challenges of global stability much harder and is increasing the risks of conflict around the world. Yeah, one of the sad parts, we obviously live in a 24-hour news cycle here, and so uh, whatever bleeds, leads. And the sad part, you get ISIL or ISIS that beheads a journalist. You know, everybody's stunned, and it's terrible, and it's actually horrible. You don't have that same type of picture thrown up there because of climate change. But I think one of the quotes I heard this morning was 300,000 people came down with asthma in Beijing last year. 300,000 people. You can tie that directly to climate change and pollution in the air. 300,000. Look at what we're doing about the Ebola virus. Wouldn't you think we'd be doing 
a hundred times that, or even a thousand times that about climate change, because everybody is impacted by that. And when you get 300,000 coming down a year in Beijing with asthma, uh, there's a problem. Now China, China does know they have a problem. Of course, they have a huge power problem as well. I understand they're building a coal power plant almost one a week still, even though they're investing in alternative energies and trying things like fusion. You know, there's another thing that we at ASP are pushing hard to say, hey, we, not only do we need to look at traditional sources of alternative energies, we need to look at non-traditional sources as well that are non-polluting and invest in that in the, in the long term. So um, there is no doubt in my mind, as you obviously know, um, that it's a tremendous threat on, on the scale, on the level, uh, way above terrorism, way above. Um, and, and think potentially way above the scale of anything we've ever seen. It, it almost seems to me like it's, um, it's almost a risk mitigation exercise, which is obviously something that the military is very familiar with, and it almost seems that um, you, know, you all and, and your colleagues in the advisory council are um, very well suited to explain that, um, that frame of reference to other decision makers around the globe because you all just seem to approach it from kind of that perspective. Yeah, I mean, this is a risk management exercise. Yeah. 450 yeah. parts per million, yeah. two degrees is a point that we judge we can manage the risks. Yeah. What we're saying, I think, is securing a two degree world is going to be pretty challenging, but is an acceptable risk management exercise. Trying to secure anything above two degrees in order that we can thrive for our economies, our prosperity, our health, and everything can, 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 can continue. Is probably a challenge beyond what is capable today. Yeah. You know, it, you would think, given enough warning, that, that you would adapt to whatever was going to come to you. And I, and I, I, uh, I look at Manhattan, and you know, this, what were the quotes this morning? That several, about a million people plus, will be displaced because of the water level rise here. And is that? I don't think at this juncture that's not stoppable. So they're going to have to adapt some way, whether you put up seawalls or, or however you're going to reclaim land. I mean, there are ways to do that. But long term, you want to mitigate that circumstance and stop what's causing it, because it's just going to continue to get worse. And the kicker is we know what's causing it. So can we not fix this? And, I, and I, we've heard that plea a lot today from industry. We've heard it from politicians. Um, you talk, and we all know it's CO2 that's causing it. There are ways to stop this. Uh, and, there were, and there are a lot of ways, and I've seen a lot of articles recently, where you can stop it and actually make it a money maker. There are jobs that can be created by doing this. Uh, so that's the positive outlook, to, the way to approach this. And I, and I think business is starting to come around. We saw it from the previous yeah, panel. Today, yeah. You bet. Um, they're, they're starting to get it. And I, you know, business is driven by the bottom line. And uh, they can be pushed in the right direction if they see a profit to it. And I think they're getting there. I would say that one of the things that are happening practically on the ground now is particularly in the field of water and disease. These are two areas where I see climate change induced conditions are beginning to bite very, very deeply in many countries and continents. For example, in the South Asian continent, what happens to the Himalayan Basin area? There is a huge amount of water scarcity problem that are coming in lean seasons because of extra melting of the ice in the, Himal in the Himalayan Basin area. There's going to be more flooding in the coming years and long-term drought when the ice is gone. There is a growing tension between sharing of the transboundary Brahmaputra River between China and India, also between India and Pakistan over the Indus Water Treaty and sharing of transboundary water because every country is now trying to hold water and use it for their own country, raising tensions. And imagine this is happening in in a very, very difficult part of the world because all these countries are nuclear countries. So any amount of tension that r goes up in those countries have severe consequences and a very, very, very fragile and risky escalation scales anywhere. So we are now dealing with not only conditions of climate-induced water conditions, but these have very serious consequences on international security. We ha also have situations of disease in many countries due to waterborne diseases and other diseases due to climate-induced conditions that are spreading disease at a rate for which many countries in the world are not capable of coping with. So we could very easily go to a situation of a semi or a pandemic situation that can have global consequences 
because we are so interconnected now. So we are now facing some of the challenges which are absolutely in the face of reality, but we are not properly prepared for that. And for that, national governments have to prepare because these are security issues and their militaries have to prepare because they are one of the key components of the national response capacity. And those are the issues we are trying to bring to our political masters. Well, thank you so much. I think that um, you've certainly uh, painted a very clear picture of the um, challenges before us, but also you know, the opportunities that we have, especially when we all work together, which is why it's so wonderful to see um, the three of you from all different corners of the globe here working on a shared issue. So thank you for your time and certainly for your service as well. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you.